this is a kind of like a little bit of an overview of um, what we are doing pre and post transplant. Um, so basically, uh, the solid organ trans transplants are done as a matter of uh, basically the therapy of choice on a variety of organ failures after nothing else can be done. Um, but because when you do an organ transplant, you have to use immunosuppression uh, to maintain that uh, allograft function that brings very specific uh, complications. And um, there are some technical issues, but the big complications are going to be either infection or malignancy. Obviously, there are also some technical complications, but in general, the, the main complications are going to be infection and uh, malignancy. So we are very much involved on the pre-transplant evaluation and then obviously uh, the post -trans the care of the post-transplant infections. And we get a lot of questions related to immunizations of both candidates before transplantation or recipients after uh, transplantation. So um, uh, we very commonly um, get asked to do pre-transplant evaluations. We probably see every single heart transplant pre-transplant uh, pre for evaluation. And selectively, we will see in our service um, most of the a, a number of kidneys and liver not all of them, like we do the heart transplants, but um, a, a fair number of them because of different questions. Um, and some of them are, you know, very complicated uh, problems that required collaboration uh, with other uh, members uh, of the team. Um, like I'm dealing right now with a lady that is going to have her third kidney transplant, has still EBV viremia, and I'm working with the kidney people and the um, 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 hematologist and and we have actually we have conferences the three of us all the time trying to get this lady because she's only 20 something needs her third transplant got transplanted as a child it's just complicated uh, pre-transplant cases that you're trying to maximize their care before they get transplanted so um, it's not only that we take care of patients after transplant but we're very much involved in very difficult cases pre-transplant. So it's important to understand um, all of these issues um, as we approach uh, transplant patients. So what do we look at when you, you're asked to look at a, um, a pre-transplant patient? Well, we obviously do a good history um, and it depends of some of them are in the hospital, some of them are, are outpatient, but the history is very important. In terms of some of the um, sicker patients, such as some of the liver transplants that are in the hospital that are very ill, uh, a lot of times they're colonized with multiple very resistant organisms. And we all know that patients get infected with what they're colonized. So that is um, something that we have to be very aware. Um, the serologies are also very important um, because we need to know especially uh, in the herpes family. We all know that in the herpes family of their eight viruses from CMB, EBV, um, um, varicella zoster, um, human herpes uh, six, um, herpes simplex. There, there's so many um, viruses that all have in common this ability to uh, be dormant or have latency, but they can reactivate. And when you change the immune system of a patient, well, this, all these viruses have the tendency to reactivate um, and cause problems. They also have in common that they can not only reactivate, but they have this um, latency reactivation and oncogenic potential. So uh, knowing all this picture uh, is really important to in the evaluation of these transplant patients. And vaccines are important because that is one way in which you can um, minimize the risk by protecting patients before transplant. Not only that, but the chances of actually having a uh, uh, having a response uh, 
is a lot higher um, when when you have when before transplant than after transplant. Uh, as a transplant patients um, have may not respond to vaccine as much, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. So we we have to have all of these things in mind while we evaluate these patients pre-transplant. So we do a, a history and a review system of the patients pre-transplant. Uh, we want to know a lot about where were they born, where they have lived, what kind of travel they have done, because we have to think about things like some of the endemic infections such as fungi. Uh, I mean, somebody that may, be, may have already been exposed to coxie or histo or any of the other uh, uh, fungal infections, um, but also things like trypanosoma or strongyloides. Um, every transplant um, gets um, screened for estrogyloides before or after transplant because uh, you don't want them to get sick after transplant when high doses of steroids are given. So we also want to know about their pets, about their water. Is a city, is a well. well? Obviously, what city water is better than well water, but we need to know and we need to um, um, evaluate the patients and also counsel them before transplant. Uh, perhaps um, they need to. They have a well that needs to have a better uh, system for purification, and that's a good thing to think about before transplant, not after transplant and having an infection. Um, we want to find out whether they have, um, whether they're having unpasteurized dairy products, where they're living, um, and obviously things like employment and and hobbies um, that may expose patients to a typical mycobacterial disease or or some other um, or some other um, different infections, um, um, sexual history like um, STDs, HIV. These days we do. Actually, uh, at our hospital at Tampa General, we do HIV positive uh, patients uh, are 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 um, no longer excluded from having uh, uh, kidney transplants. So we actually have a program that includes HIV patients, but we need to make sure that we know um, that history and we need to know the medications that they're taking because there are certain medications that are not a good idea. Uh, in the setting of transplantation. Uh, you wouldn't want medications to have, um, for example, you wouldn't want um, any of the medications that have, that would cause a lot of drug interactions. So there's certain so we actually see these patients, uh, all the HIV patients that get uh, transplanted, uh, we will evaluate them ahead of time, make sure that uh, there is no, no other, um, problems that may come out that the patient may not have had cryptococcus and may need to be on diflucan for life. Uh, make sure that they're in the correct HIV medications. Um, uh, obviously, drug and alcohol abuse is always something that we check. And having on whether you have had a, a patient have had an splenectomy or not is important as well because of the susceptibility uh, of certain infections because they need different types of vaccines. So um, this we do need to look at these patients carefully before transplant. And like I mentioned before, we as a group um, and when you're in our team, you will be seeing the majority of the heart transplant patients before transplant. And in the office, you will see a significant number of the uh, kidney transplant patients uh, or kidney candidate, kidney transplant candidates before transplant, we will see all the HIV positive candidates um, uh, for kidney transplant. And in the hospital, we frequently see pre-transplant a lot of the liver uh, candidates, liver transplant candidates, because those are usually very sick and uh, a lot of uh, other um, issues may be important. Um, Pre-transplant, and this is across the board, there is laboratory testing that gets done both on the candidates and you will. we will talk a little bit later about some of the donors. Uh, we need to understand the candidate, but we also have to understand the donor because uh, all of these things are very much interactive. Um, we The lab testing of the 
uh, candidate includes obviously HIV, and like I said, we uh, do we currently do um, kidney transplants. We don't do hearts or lungs, but we do uh, kidneys, and we also do we are about ready to do livers as well. So uh, our program will do um, HIV positive livers and kidneys. Uh, already doing kidneys, soon to do uh, livers. We want to know the serology for hepatitis A, B, and C, um, and understanding that, for example, hepatitis A, you either have it or not, and if you don't have it, then we try to vaccinate you ahead of time. Hepatitis B will be electron on its own <laughs> um, because we have to know what the candidate has, but then the donor hepatitis B serology is really important because it will influence what you do with prophylaxis afterwards. Um, and um, uh, the hepatitis B serology and what to do is a very, is somewhat complex. And I actually encourage all of you to review the guidelines that we have, um, that all the ID physicians at Tampa General um, have put together with all the teams um, for um, all of these um, organisms, all of these viruses and different things, because it really helps you understand how complex um, all of this um, serology and how to address the patient, how to protect them from reactivation. Um, all of these things are um, have been uh, are complex, but at the same time, we do have guidelines for them. Uh, CMV is very important. Um, we, you, anybody that, any of you that have been in our service or any service where they take care of transplant, you know, the two things that you always say uh, when you take care of a transplant patient is how long ago did the, the, is, this is a status pose, a kidney transplant, a heart transplant, a whatever transplant that was done on whatever date and what the CMV serology is of the patient and the donor. So that's something that you all are very familiar with. Uh, EBV, the same way. Uh, in adults, EBV is not as much of an issue because the majority of our patients after age, uh, adult patients are already EBV positive and the uh, donors may or may not be EBV positive, but the patients are EBV positive. But for example, in pediatrics, um, uh, EBV mismatch is a big deal. Um, and like I was mentioning before, I'm currently dealing with a case in which she's a very young woman that will be going to her third tra her kidney transplant. Uh, and unfortunately, her last transplant was an EBV mismatch. So she has persistent EBV viremia, which is a really difficult problem to deal with. Varicella, uh, serology, uh, syphilis, toxoplasma, um, um, Tuberculosis, uh, latent tuberculosis is an important thing to do. One of the most difficult diagnoses to do to make after transplant is tuberculosis. Very difficult diagnosis to make after post-transplant. So we want to know whether a patient had latent TB and treat them before transplant. That is very important because after transplant, it's really hard to do. Um, Estrongyloides is also very important um, because we treat them pre-transplant. After transplant with all the immunosuppression, uh, they can get the hyperimmune syndrome and they can get very sick with pneumonia uh, and even a gram negative meningitis from estrongyloides. So that's very important to take care of. And we obviously spend a lot of time when appropriate, depending on the history and where they have lived. Um, we may want to get uh, different um, serology for uh, fungi, leishmania, trypanosoma, um, and uh, and the same goes for um, other um, other infections, depending of an, of what endemic area the patient is coming from. Whether, for example, um, if this patient has Chagas because it's from Venezuela or Brazil or some of the um, Latin American countries. Today, we always have in mind the um, COVID-19 serology of both the patient, uh, not the serology, but actually they all get a screen PCR-wise. Um, the patient is, so it's not serology, but it's actually PCR. Serology, um, PCR testing of both the patients and the um, donors. And there have been an occasional case, but uh, 
the protocols in place have been actually quite successful uh, um, in the in transplant. And for a while, transplantation was kind of last year in 2020, uh, there was a decrease in transplantation. Um, but these days, transplantation continues to go on. We just are very careful about uh, doing uh, proper screening of both donors and um, recipients. Whether they are recipients that are living or disease, uh, because obviously in kidney transplant, uh, living related transplantation is a very important part uh, of transplantation. And that's something not to be uh, ignored or forgotten that not all transplantation comes from a disease donor. A lot of times, especially in kidney transplant, the donor may be a living related donor, uh, whether it's a family member, a friend, or, or in, in, in many other cases. So understanding all of these things is important. And when you're dealing with a living related transplant, um, uh, you have to be very careful what you tell patients from the donor and the recipient because there's already an emotional component. And um, if the uh, donor, which is actually a living person that is willing to give a kidney away to a, a recipient, uh, there's a problem about a potential infection or something like that, that has tremendous implication that has to be handled very, very, very carefully and very diplomatic. Um, I have been involved in some of those uh, cases, like something as simple as a CMV mismatch between siblings, where a recipient uh, from a living related was CMV negative, but got CMV from the donor. And the sister was horribly, felt horribly guilty that she gave the brother CMV because he got really sick as a transplant. Well, handling things like that is really important, doing it in a very diplomatic and uh, sympathetic way because, gosh, already this woman has given the brother a kidney, which is a big deal. Um, but it happens that she was CMV positive. Some of these things may be better discussed early before transplantation so that there's no confusion and there's um, less um, issues afterwards. But understanding all of this serology and understanding how all of these things work uh, during transplant is uh, very important. Okay, so what are the things that we treat pre-transplant? We just talked a little bit. Um, we spend a lot of time going through the uh, laboratory testing that we do pre-transplant um, and uh, on those uh, recipients. Uh, but there are some specific things that we definitely try to uh, make sure that we uh, do treatments on uh, pre-transplant, and that includes um, is a patient who have any, any STD, uh, tuberculosis in latent TB. We we see a lot of patients pre-transplant because they need to be treated for uh, latent TB. And uh, uh, once they're on therapy, we allow them to get uh, transplanted. We just finished the therapy post-transplant. A particular challenge on treating latent TB is on liver transplant patients because uh, most of these medication, most of the regimens um, uh, um, are difficult in, a, uh, in an end stage liver disease, but we still need to treat them. Um, so, um, strongyloides, we always treat pre transplant, and obviously, all active infections. You do not transplant anybody with an active infection. Um, the um, one of the exceptions of, of this active infection rule is the patients that have ventricular assist devices. A lot of them are uh, the uh, ventricular assist device is infected. Um, they're no longer bacteremic or septic. That has been controlled, but they are on suppression therapy for whatever organism. Well, the only therapy for a chronically infected ventricular assist device is getting a heart transplant. Um, and then you have to treat those patients post-transplant for uh, four to six weeks uh, for whatever bacteria it was that they had pre-transplant. So that will be a, an exception that, um, that you will see that we're gonna uh, be treating uh, frequently. Dr. Cancio, can I interrupt? I have a quick question. Sure. 
Um, what do we do with indeterminate quantifurons pre-transplant and how do you kind of handle those situations? Well, um, it, an indeterminate um, uh, quantiferon is you, it's not positive or negative. There's nothing. We most of the time we um, try to um, a lot of times we'll do a two-step PPD or we'll do another uh, uh, um, gamma release assay, assay other than interferon, uh, which you can which you can do uh, and see if you can have an answer. And uh, you can also look at the um, chest X-ray, CT scan of the chest, and see if there's any. Uh, reason to think that this patient may have been exposed and make a clinical decision um, because an indeterminate doesn't mean that it's positive or negative. It means that it doesn't mean anything. So you want to make um, um, a determination based on other factors like we did before we even had um, any of these um, gamma release assays, which we did. I mean, we uh, had to do um, two-step PPDs. But there's also other uh, gamma release assays that you can do or look at the CT scan uh, or, or chest X-ray, depending on the particular patient and go from there based on history, where they have lived, you know, other uh, factors. A lot of them will tell you that they have had a positive PPD in the past. So, so you go back to um, to history and other clinical findings. So, so then if you have like if you have someone that you would sit consider high risk? Would you treat them for latent TB if they don't have any signs or yes. symptoms on? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, suppose that you have somebody that um, tells you that, um, oh yeah, my father had tuberculosis and when I was a kid, I was tested um, or, and I was never treated. Uh, something, you know, if the history is appropriate, you go ahead and treat them. You don't hold back because Tuberculosis post-transplant, number one, is a really difficult diagnosis to make, and, uh, and the patients can get really sick and has a very high mortality. Um, um, I, I have, unfortunately, taken care of a few as a transplant, and they're not. That is a very difficult diagnosis to make. Um, so the other indications for prophylaxis are not only... Um, and, and that's why I'm putting it in the indication for prophylaxis is obviously having a positive test, a positive IGRA, but a history that is consistent because like um, Michelle said, I mean, you may not have a, a clear uh, test, but if the history and everything looks like you should, you go ahead. Um, and, all, and the other big thing is recipients of a transplant from a donor that have been untreated. And occasionally you'll get a consult where a patient uh, nobody, a donor, nobody knew one, but the pathology, and they do pathology on um, all the donors, um, some of their lymph nodes and things like that. They say, well, there were granulomas, we don't know. So you'll hear that, and then you go ahead and treat those as well. Um, obviously, we treat all the bacterial and fungal infections, whatever it is, before transplant, if you can, especially those patients that are in the hospital, uh, you want to DC lines, folies, just like you want to minimize any nosocomial infections like you would in any patients. A lot of the uh, colonizing organisms are important for not only um, you're not going to be able to decolonize anybody, but those things are important to know for uh, to have in mind for uh, prophylactic antibiotics or empiric therapy if a patient gets septic. So those, um, so it's important to know uh, what patients are colonized with whatever organism, whether it's MRSA, BRE, or other multidrug resistant organisms, um, because you would you would take that in consideration for surgical prophylaxis, and you will also take in consideration if that patient happens to get septic. Um, this is uh, some of the things that you can see um, from a infection considerations that you can see from potential donors, and it's simple, you know, it's from up to date. But there are the number of possibilities coming from a donor are many, and um, and all of these things get evaluated before the donor uh, is even considered. And as infection disease physicians that work with transplant teams, you get calls about this all the time. Uh, even when 
I may not be on call. I may get a call from the transplant team uh, because they worry about a, a donor having any of these things, whether it's, oh my gosh, it's, um, uh, this donor died, but nobody knew exactly um, what was happening. It, it wasn't, it's easy if the patient, ha if the donor came from a um, car accident or something like that, that is not a, that there's no concerns. But for example, a patient that may have had an unusual, unusual encephalitis or um, some unusual situation, a lot of times uh, those patients, um, you will get called to help decide whether this is a donor that um, you're willing to take or not. I mean, like think about if there's any concern for, uh, for CJD or rabies and all, and there have been reported cases of rabies uh, trans, um, uh, during transplantation and all of these things. So you have to have them, you have to think about these things um, uh, um, carefully. Um, uh, we just mentioned tuberculosis or pneumonias and some of these other things um, in, the, in our area, especially in South Florida, you'll find that um, Chagas is something that they pretty much take in consideration and you'll, you'll hear about serology uh, uh, frequently. So there are a lot of considerations that you may get asked because the donor, um, whatever the donor has may uh, be a problem for the recipient and you will get calls on that once you're part of a transplant team. So uh, we have talked a lot about the pre-transplant evaluation. We have talked a lot about um, the donor and some of the considerations that we have to have for them. Um, so now after transplant, one of the first things that you have to consider is what organ are you transplanting? Are you transplanting a um, uh, heart, a heart, a lung, a kidney, a liver, a pancreas? A lot of times you have combinations. It's very common to have a kidney and pancreas together, but these days you'll see a heart and a kidney or a liver and um, whatever. Uh, so those things are important. Um, so that you know, uh, small bowels are also transplanted, but that is the uh, that is a transplant that we do not do at Tampa General. But um, small bowels uh, are also a small bowel transplant are done, and uh, for a long time I follow one patient that was done in Nebraska. And uh, so, as an eye infection disease physician, uh, you get involved on some of the things that you may not do locally but um, the patients come to your office because they went somewhere else. Actually, uh, uh, University of Miami uh, uh, does uh, uh, small bowel transplants, but we don't. Um, but we, uh, but they, they, so you have to consider post-transplant what organ you have. And there's some, uh, some technical issues that are very important in the particular um, organ. For example, if you have a liver transplant, a lot of the complications post-transplant may be related to some of the uh, thrombosis or, um, or, or issues with anastomosis in the liver or uh, issues that have to do with um, bile ducts and things like that. Uh, in the heart may be totally different uh, because you may have more problems with um, mediastinal problems, external uh, infections. The patients may be after a VAD and they come with a previous um, um, ventricular cyst device infection. Uh, in the lungs, a, a very important issue is the issue of uh, anastomosis in the trach where they, anast they do anastomosis and those can be very particular problems. Uh, in the kidneys, majority of the kidneys, when they get transplanted, they get stents. Um, and though the patient may get an infection and, uh, in the early post-transplant uh, period from a kidney, and it may be related to the stents and you have to figure out whether the stent can come out or not. So um, post-transplant, when you have an infection, you're looking at the patient very early. There are some technical issues and there's something, some things that are particular for each organ. As time goes by, um, then uh, after the uh, uh, post-transplant period, uh, you always want to have a consideration of not only what kind of organ you have, but the risk of infection besides technical issues is what is this patient being exposed to and what immunosuppression uh, this patient has because the risk of infection 
inspection is very much a, um, is a product of what are they exposed to and what, how much immunosuppression they have. Uh, different immunosuppression uh, will uh, lead to different uh, or predispose you for different infections. Um, and obviously, uh, this is a group of patients that can have more than one infection. They may have, uh, frequently they have multiple simultaneous uh, 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 infections that, uh, and that can be hard to, uh, to deal with at the same time. So when we're trying to look at uh, a post transplant, we actually look at, you know, we look at um, what, are these, what are the potential exposures of this patient? Do they have any latent pathogens that may be reactivating, whether it's CMB or EBV? Or, or for example, in kidneys, which is very specific for kidneys, the BK virus, that not only can reactivate and cause uh, viremia, but it will cause um, 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 rejection of the kidney. Uh, so BK virus in the kidney transplant is very important. Uh, Donor-derived infections um, are, 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 are something that you always have to remember, whether it's a strongyloides or uh, the toxo or the patient uh, uh, or the donor came from an endemic fungi area or tuberculosis. Uh, or whatever. So we need to make sure that we understand uh, the history of exposures, what latent pathogens, and, this, and that's why the serology, understanding the serology of the, both the donor and the recipient are important. Uh, Donor-derived infections, uh, we constantly think about those. And you, you, many times when you're in our service, you get notified, oh, the donor grew, the pathology showed, whatever. And those are things that we take in, co in consideration. And um, maybe all of a sudden uh, you hear that the donor had uh, had cryptococcus, and then you're going to treat the, the, the recipient or tuberculosis or uh, any other um, infection. There's some of them that are very concerning and they have been reported like rabies or some of the other uh, more difficult infections. Um, so uh, the, the immunosuppressive agents, whether they're neutropenic, a lot of times the patient is neutropenic because of the medications that they're being given. Remember that post-transplant, uh, a lot of these immunosuppressive agents ca cause neutropenia and some of the medications that are given post-transplant like for um, for um, prophylaxis like septra, like valsite may cause uh, neutropenia, and then you're preventing those infections by you're making the patient more susceptible to um, whether it is bacterial infections or fungal infections. Uh, community acquired pathogens are also very important. You, can't, you, you have to remember what's happening in your community uh, because the patients, these transplant patients get the same thing that everybody else, but they just they just look sicker and they have more than one pathogen. Uh, whether so, is the, in the community you have influenza, par influenza, RSV, or whatever. Like right now, um, if you think about what we have at Tampa General with uh, with COVID nineteen, the a lot of the transplant patients have been vaccinated, but they are um, very sick, even though they were vaccinated, even though they had good response to the vaccine and you can see that they have good titers they're still getting uh COVID-19 and because what is happening in the community affects transplant patients to a very large extent much more than they would somebody else because of their immune system and uh, and right now we all, you all have seen it at Tampa General where uh, you have um, transplant patients that were vaccinated that had good response to the vaccine and and, and currently are sick, sick in the hospital. It, um, unfortunately, uh, many of them are on ventilators. Um, uh, last weekend, we had a couple of them uh, like that. So those things are important. And the geography uh, is quite Im important. Um, we have all seen uh, post-transplant patients that travel to whatever, like um, not that long ago, I saw one that went to, um, to um, um, Kentucky and came, and came back with histoplasma. So those things are important. And that's why we need to talk to the patients and get good history. Obviously, the reactivation of infections post-transplant are, crit are critical. And that's why they get all of this. Uh, we do all of these pre-transplant evaluations. And we use on the, most, um, on the times that are the most immunosuppressed, 
uh, which is the first six months post transplant, we use uh, prophylaxis therapy um, uh, and, and we try to pick up some of these things pre transplant and try to take care of them, like for latent TB or for estrangeloides or uh, some of these things, um, because they can reactivate. Um, uh, herpes simplex reactivates frequently. Uh, that is why every transplant patient uh, gets at least a, a Valtrex. If they if they don't have CMV, they get Valtrex. If they have, if they may reactivate for CMV, then they get Valsite because Valsite will take care of both CMV and herpes. Uh, uh, um, having shingles post transplant is very common, uh, and they usually may get dissemination. They may get uh, they may actually even get meningitis. They may have, they look, uh, they just don't have one dermatome. And we see that very frequently uh, in the hospital where a patient gets uh, varicella zoster reactivation shingles, and, but they're not just one area or one dermatome. They get multi, many dermatomes and dissemination and even meningitis. And we see that. And actually, they even become viremic, where they, uh, you can measure the um, varicella zoster virus PCR in the blood. Um, hepatitis B and C are a big issue. Um, this it used to be for a long time that we were very careful about not using hepatitis B core antibody donors. We do now. Uh, we do hepatitis B core antibody donors. And those required um, looking at the recipient, and some of them uh, would require follow-up um, um, and including therapy uh, with um, an hepatitis B uh, therapy, like um, depending on the case, you may use uh, different um, with it, maybe entecavir or one of the one of the therapies. But that because we actually to increase the donor pool. Uh, today, hepatitis B core antibody positives are used in all the in all the organs, and again, that is a complicated um, area that um, you know to get through more more of the basic uh, issues. I'm not going to go in in detail, but when you're in our service, definitely look at those guidelines that we have and discuss with your attending because that 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 is a very uh, important area of how, how to deal with hepatitis B core antibody donors, and we use them has increased the the donor pool. But um, but as an infectious disease physician, you will get lots of questions about that. Hepatitis C uh, donors were not used for a long time. Now they're being used, and the uh, pa all pa all patients are consented, and hepatitis C donors are used. So you're going to treat hepatitis C after transplant uh, because we have such good therapy. Something that in the past was not used at all. Right now we do use hepatitis C uh, donors, and the recipient will get hepatitis C and will get treated uh, because we have such good therapies. Um, the uh, papilloma virus is mainly an issue of. Uh, in kidney transplant and BK viremia, uh, there, we have a protocol for BK viremia uh, in kidney transplant. That's something limited to uh, kidney transplants. And basically, we have to reduce immunosuppression, try to control the, um, the viremia because otherwise they will reject and they have, uh, and that is a common cause of uh, rejection in the kidney transplant population. Um, we have talked about how important it is estrogeloides, and that's why we actually uh, check both the donor and the recipient. And, uh, and if the recipient is positive, we treat them pre-transplant. If the donor is positive, then we treat uh, very early post-transplant. Tuberculosis is hard, like I have said before. We treat the recipients if we know about a pre-transplant, and if we have any inclination that the donor may have had latent TB or anything, then we treat the uh, the recipient afterwards as well. So um, there are many donor derived infections that uh, whether it's a CMB mismatch or toxo um, or any of this um, uh, more uh, unusual like West Nile or uh, um, lymphocytic meningitis, rabies has been uh, reported, Chagas, um, um, and there are protocols uh, to be followed. And 
all anything that is donor derived actually has to be reported uh, to um, in the to UNOS, which is um, so that they compiled this information. Um, and that's why organ donor screening is so important uh, because you have to, you want to make sure that these patients, that you know what the patient has before uh, and, and, um, and make sure that you don't transplant somebody that may, for example, have rabies or some of these things that may be uh, dif difficult to, the, that would, would not have a good outcome on the recipient. So these are some of the things that have, uh, it's another list of donor derived uh, infections in organ transplantation from all the herpes viruses like we have talked about, because we, ha we understand that all the herpes viruses, whether uh, herpes simplex one and two and CMB and ABB and varicella, they all have this ability to cause latency, but if you have latency, that means that you can reactivate uh, and some of them have oncogenic potential, like for example, her, um, a human herpes 8 associated with Kaposi sarcoma in transplant patients, which is rare, but you see it. And, um, and but um, all of the other um, uh, bacteria such as tuberculosis or fungal infections, uh, but like not uncommonly, you'll get a call that when they did the donor um, biopsy in pathology, they saw crypto, and we have seen those. Um, we, we see that in in South Florida, in, in our area in Florida, not that infrequently. So we treat the recipient. Uh, the same thing goes with um, with toxoplasma. Uh, that patient is negative, and the donor was toxopositive. Uh, coming from South Florida, you see some patients uh, that have a, a Chagas a serology. Um, and uh, the same thing with the strongyloides, and then we need to treat those uh, um, when once we know that the donor was positive. Then the other thing about post-transplant infections, we talk, we have spent a lot of time uh, talking about that pre-transplant evaluation, trying to minimize risk uh, because we were able to do a good pre-transplant evaluation, trying to treat anything pre-transplant, trying to understand if uh, the, the donor gave anything to the recipient, um, what was the, are they mismatched? What are the prophylaxis? All of those things that we talk about constantly uh, are very important, but the patients get transplanted and they move on, right? So um, when you get consulted in the post-transplant period, one of the first things that we always say is that how long ago was this patient transplanted? because a lot of the infections have to do a lot with the timing, whether it's the first month, uh, whether it is the first six months, which is the period of more immunosuppression or more than six months. So, uh, so that is something that, those are the, like the three periods that we think about uh, when you look about, uh, about a patient uh, in the post-transplant period, trying to figure out in that, in that setting. The first month, month is very common just nosocomial infections. They're either uh, infections that come from either the donor or the recipient. Um, and in infection complications that have to do with a, with a surgery, technical nosocomial infections, line infection, pneumonia, ventilator associated pneumonias. Uh, in, uh, and then and each one, like, like we're talking about, like for perhaps in the kidneys related, a pyelonephritis related to a stent. In the liver, perhaps a uh, related to some kind of obstruction uh, and some problem the biliary tree. Uh, in the heart, uh, maybe something to do with the sternum or something related to the uh, uh, ventricular cyst device that they took out. So it depends on the, on the organ. So it's very much uh, technical, nosocomial, uh, and maybe something that came from the, from the donor. That would be the first month. Um, um, pneumonia, surgical site infection, line sepsis, UTI. Uh, there, you also have to always think of non-infectious causes of fever, like a pulmonary embolus. Um, uh, think about if there's anything to drain, a hematoma, a pleural effusion. Pat these patients have been in and out of the hospital, so they'll get C. diff. Uh, and you also want to keep in mind what were those organisms that the patient was colonized with, whether it were MRSA or VRE or whatever, because those are the things that uh, not only that um, that the patient, may, if they're colonized, that's what they're going to get infected with. And for empiric therapy, when they get septic, that's something oh, something that you must have in mind. Now, 
the one to six months post transplant that is the that is a, a very it's a time where the patients are really immunosuppressed it's the most immunosuppressed time so they're most at risk for opportunistic infections so we do a prevention right so you do obviously not pcp anymore pjp but uh but you do you know all the transplant patients get uh put on um Bactrim uh, or Septra, and if they're allergic on Mepron, uh, and if they cannot do that, pentamidine. Uh, so, so they're going to get some kind of prophylaxis for all these things. If there was a toxopositive uh, recipient or there was a toxo mismatch, uh, they're going to get prophylaxis for CMV, uh, uh, especially difficult are the CMV mismatches. But if, even in the CMV positive patient, they will get prophylaxis or they may get prophylaxis for herpes if they're they're negative. A CMB negative donor into a CMB negative recipient is like, I always call that almost like hitting the lottery in, in transplantation. If you are negative and you get a CMB negative uh, uh, donor, wow, you, you just, you actually had a very, um, you're very lucky because that not only will make you unlikely to get CMV, but it has multiple implications in terms of rejection or the co-infections uh, uh, um, that will help you uh, as a uh, as a transplant uh, patient incredibly. So that would be great. But but we do think about all these things to uh, get uh, prophylaxis post transplant for the first six months. And obviously, the other things that we do, depending on uh, a, a VAD may need uh, after a VAD that was infected, you may need antibiotics. Um, some of the patients more complicated CMB patients may need a uh, cytogam. So there's a lot of these things that we do to minimize infections um, um, uh, on the post-transplant period in this very critical time. Uh, the major opportunistic infections that you see in patients uh, is obviously um, pneumocystis, but you can also have toxo and leishmania. And uh, geographically, uh, we have taken care of patients um, um, they have either some of them are getting them from the donor, but some of them have gotten them uh, after the post transplant by traveling, like histoplasma going, like I just said, for example, somebody uh, going to the correct area uh, and getting uh, histoplasma or coxy. Um, and um, patients can get hepatitis C or hepatitis B afterwards. Uh, again, the uh, BK virus is very important in kidney transplant, and you see how there is, there's a protocol to be followed uh, for BK viremia in the kidney transplant patients, uh, and then you have to reduce immunosuppression because otherwise they'll lose their kidney. Um, so these are some of the uh, uh, opportunistic infections that we deal with all the time. Now, after six months, um, most of the patients have somewhat of a stable and reduced level of immunosuppression because they're no longer in that particular period. Um, but, you know, you also need to make sure that you understand whether they have had a recent rejection. Because if a patient has had a recent rejection and they have been given like um, treatment for that rejection, depending on what that treatment is, that patient may be predisposed for different infections, whether it may be meningococcal because of specific infection or they got um, um, whatever. And a lot of them, once they, even after six months, they get a really strong uh, immunosuppression because of rejection and you have to restart some of the prophylaxis that, and that they have been off because it's kind of like way after transplant. Um, and But they start seeing other things you see Community acquired pathogens a lot more, um, but they look a lot worse. Uh, you also see other things like nocardia, cryptococcus, some of these other things that, and some of the effects of long term effects of viral infections, like uh, from EBV viremia, you may have uh, a PTLD uh, lymphomas. And it's very important to understand that some of the patients may have developed, are incredibly predisposed to having. Um, skin cancers um, or um, um, because of the immunosuppression and also because some of the medicines that they get and being transplant and also uh, some of the other, oh, almost any cancer is more uh, common in transplant patients, but HPV can cause a lot of problems, both uh, ENT cancers in the or anogenital ano region. So, um, we're going to move on to uh, understand that viruses can also be uh, co somewhat copathogens. So you can have a patient that has 
um, that may have had a, a, a RSV, but then they get aspergillus. Uh, um, they can get, they have from EBV that go on to develop a malignancy like PTLD. Um, the issue of CMV reactivation is always an issue because it upregulates um, uh, the histocompatibility antigens and, cause, and can cause uh, graft rejection. So all of a sudden you have somebody with CMV reactivation, you decrease immunosuppression, you're treating it, but now you have to deal with a graft rejection. So you have to uh, deal with both of those things about at the same time. And you cannot forget that these viruses are oncogenic viruses, whether it's hepatitis C or B, uh, and both of them can cause um, hepatocellular carcinoma, EBV, uh, viremias are very common on these patients, and they can go on to uh, produce lymphomas and PTLD, whether it's a monoclonal or polyclonal type of um, lymphomas. And human uh, and HPV uh, causing problems both uh, in the genital area uh, at ENT. Um, the, the type of immunosuppression that they have uh, may be influencing what kind of infection they, they get. So um, a lot of patients are giving early on what is called uh, um, induction therapy, and those are some of the anti-lymphocyte globulins like OKT3 or thymoglobulin. And those things are really um, immunosuppressive. Uh, think about how you worry about a patient, an HIV patient that has CD4 counts on less than 200. Well, um, these patients, uh, their CD3s go under 25. Um, and remember that CD3s uh, go on to divide it between fours and eight. So they, they have no T cells. Um, uh, steroids uh, are really lymphocytic and, and the principal patients to, um, to reactivations of hepatitis B, C, um, and so many other things, um, and, and so forth. I mean, um, uh, cell sep, which is microphenolate, um, causes uh, significant problems with CMV. Um, so, so we have, depending um, depending on the um, on the kind of immunosuppression that they have early on, and then later when they reject, when they use some of these things, you're going to have to make sure that that um, that those things are uh, are uh, that you have it in that you ha that you understand what immunosuppression what kind of rejection the patient had how it was treated um, uh, CMV in transplant patient is a whole lecture on its own uh, and it can cause um, and uh, and I encourage you to uh, again, um, follow some of the patients that have CMV, um, and you always want to know whether CMV in a transplant patient is what we call primary CMV or reactivation. Primary CMV commonly is comes from a CMV mismatch and the patient or a new infection from uh, in the post-transplant period versus reactivation. Those are the very different um, uh, behaviors in, in CMV and how they affect and how you treat them. Uh, and that's something that you really should understand well um, uh, uh, with CMV. Um, and uh, in the evaluation of the post-transplant patient that has, that looks like it has an infection, uh, we are very aggressive at trying to come to a diagnosis. Uh, in transplantation, you, you uh, just empiric therapy is not good enough. You have to get to a diagnosis. Uh, in solid organ, in solid organ transplantation. So we we are very uh, aggressive at doing CTs, MRIs. You want to know, do I, is there something to be uh, drained? Um, the patient comes in with pneumonia and doesn't respond quickly. We go and do a um, you know bronchoscopy. Um, um, so we always know what the pre-transplant and post-transplant serology is. So we have to constantly. Uh, understand that diagnosis is the key to be able to provide good care. So we'll, bi we'll biopsy um, if we have, you know, whatever needs to be done to get to a diagnosis. But frequently, the only way we can make a diagnosis of tuberculosis is by doing a bone marrow bi biopsy. Uh, so whatever we need to do to get to a diagnosis, um, because it's very difficult to guess, and these patients can have anything, and, um, and you need to... Um, quickly um, try to do uh, a diagnosis. Um, immunizations are really important in the pre-transplant period. Um, and this is almost like a whole lecture uh, on its own, uh, but it's nine o'clock. Uh, the main thing to remember is that we try to um, give 
all the immunizations as much as we can pre-transplant. Um, we do not give live, live virus vaccines post-transplant. And if you give a live virus vaccine on a pre-transplant patient, you have to wait uh, four weeks before that patient can be transplanted. Uh, but we do all immunizations and we uh, very much um, uh, try to make sure that the patients pre-transplant get all their childhood uh, immunizations up to, the, up to date. Hepatitis C e and B is a given uh, Tdap, influenza, pneumococcal. But also, uh, if the patient has never had uh, um, varicella, we vaccinate them pre-transplant. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, if they have had that already uh, given Shingrix, uh, uh, not uh, the other um, um, vaccine. Um, and um, depending on the situation, meningococcal vaccine. And very important is the HPV vaccine. Uh, for all of those that may be able, that are eligible, um, we're very liberal on trying to tell patients to get the HPV vaccine because um, um, HPV-related um, cancers are very common in the post-transplant period. So I'll stop here. It's a little bit after nine. Actually, it's nine or two, according to my phone. And um, I'm certainly, um, if you have a, a question, I don't know how much time you have. I'm happy to uh, answer that. <laughs>